Australia is in the midst of an experiment. The transformation of an energy grid powered mainly by coal-fired generation to one powered by renewables. In a previous video, I questioned the Business Council's claims that this can largely be achieved by 2030. The new Federal Labor Government has a similar, although slightly less, ambitious target. Whatever the long-term plan, electricity prices in the eastern states of Australia are at an all-time high this winter. Mechanical failures force several coal-fired power stations to shut down one or more generators and gas is in short supply, so running gas turbines is expensive. The government stepped in capping prices at $300 a megawatt hour for a few days. But while colder winter temperatures are partly to blame, there appears to be an underlying problem. Australia has enough sun and wind to provide all our energy needs, but it takes time and money to build the means of capturing that energy. Are energy shortages and high prices a sign we are getting ahead of ourselves in making the transition? This graph shows the average wholesale price for power over the last year in two states. In South Australia, which now gets 60% of its power from renewables, it was $45 a megawatt hour on average. In New South Wales, it was $65 a megawatt hour. The price did go up last winter, but it was still only $150 a megawatt hour in New South Wales. This year, the price skyrocketed from March to May. The wholesale price of electricity from generators is normally well under $100 a megawatt hour, or 10 cents a kilowatt hour. If you are lucky, you might be paying something like that for off-peak electricity. And you're probably paying at least 25 cents a kilowatt hour for general use. Generation accounts for less than half the retail cost so if the wholesale price is $300 a megawatt hour, which is 30 cents a kilowatt hour, retailers are losing badly. These costs will be passed on to the consumer. Before I go further, first some explanation about the NEM dashboard, a website with statistics for generation and demand, which is updated every five minutes. The Australian energy market operator operates the national energy market, which includes New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. These states have interconnected grids and can trade electricity from where the wind is blowing or the sun is shining to where it isn't. Sorry to Western Australia and New Northern Territory, but you are left out. Here are some prices from the dashboard back in the good old days of early March. This was early in the morning, while the sun was still low in the sky, wind speed was also low, yet the price was well below $100 a megawatt hour, and only $20 in South Australia and Victoria. By April, the problem was beginning to bite. Here at 6pm in the evening on the 12th of April, the price in each state was well above $200 a megawatt hour. Then in May, the price really began to spike after sunset, with prices hitting thousands of dollars a megawatt hour. Here at 5.30 on the 9th of May, the price was over $1,200 a megawatt hour in Queensland and New South Wales, and over $12,000 a megawatt hour in South Australia. Ten minutes later, all states except Tasmania were over $4,000 a megawatt hour. The following day, South Australia hit $9,900 before 6pm. South Australia gets a lot of its energy from wind, which it normally has in abundance. Gas generally makes up the remainder. Diesel generators are only used rarely as a backup, but for this peak, they supplied 18% of the demand. Because they are rarely used, the price for diesel power is very high. The downside of wind is illustrated comparing a day in South Australia in March and one in May. On the 7th of March, wind was providing 88% of energy at 6.35pm. But on the 12th of May, wind strength was less than a tenth of that day in March. Not only did they need diesel generation, but the interconnector from Victoria was maxed out at 600 megawatts, providing one third of the state's energy. And yet, during daylight hours, we often had an excess of renewable energy, even in May, like this snapshot at 1pm on the 3rd, 
leading to negative prices as the generators battle to get someone to take their energy. Here Tasmania is conserving water by taking nearly half its energy from Victoria. So how much renewable energy do you need to be sure you have enough? This graph from OpenNEM shows power generation for the 12 months to June, split between renewables and all other. As the circular chart on the bottom right clearly shows, renewables provided a third of our energy at 33.2% of the total over the year. So we are well on the way in the transition. Does this mean we just build double again what we have and we'll reach 100% from renewables? As we will see, it is a lot more complicated than that. Firstly, note the monthly variations. Demand was highest in January and July, but for July, renewables were only 29%. To replace coal energy, you would need to base your calculations on the 29% as the worst case. This next graph from OpenNEM for the same period shows the breakdown from all sources. Yellow is solar, wind is green, blue is hydro, and so on. Among renewables, solar was the biggest contributor at over 13% of the total, but with wide variation. It was 19% in December, but less than 8% in July. Wind had less variation, being roughly 11% in December and 13 in July, with a minimum of just over 10 in March. So even though solar is the cheapest form of generation, to replace coal, you might have to favour wind rather than solar, as wind is more reliable in winter when demand is highest. Hydro was 7.9% with 6.2 terawatt hours for the year. That could only be increased if we dam more rivers in mountainous wilderness areas, which is as untenable as shooting koalas. Therefore, annual output cannot increase much beyond 16 terawatt hours. We can use hydro to help meet peak demand, but the energy to replace coal and gas must come primarily from wind and solar. Having looked at the variation over months, this next graph from OpenNEM shows daily variations over a week from the 25th of June to the 1st of July. There is a daily cycle with a peak occurring just after sunset, and at this time of the year, it is around 30 gigawatts on weekdays. Minimum demand was around 3 to 4 a.m., dipping below 19 gigawatts. Autumn months have the same daily cycle, as this graph from April shows, but the peaks are around 25 gigawatts, rather than 30 gigawatts as in winter. The nighttime minimum is also slightly less. Summer months have a similar daily cycle as this graph from January shows, but the peak occurs in the late afternoon due to high air conditioning loads. On most days, the peak hit 30 gigawatts, about the same as winter, but the 31st of January was a very hot day with a peak of 36.7 gigawatts. The nighttime minima were similar to winter at 19 gigawatts. These graphs illustrate that power demand varies a lot. Gas and hydro can be turned up to meet the high demand but coal generation is much harder to adjust and is less efficient when demand is low. The contribution from solar and wind can be turned off if it is not needed, but you take what you are given and cannot turn it up if you need more. To replace coal, you need to build enough renewable capacity for the worst case, which means you will have excess the rest of the year. So how do you work out the minimum combination of solar panels and wind turbines needed for 100% renewable energy? Starting with wind, this graph plots wind energy each day over the year to June. It is a very wiggly line because wind strength varies a lot day to day. Average daily output was about 67 gigawatt hours, but at the top, there were 10 days with nearly double that, above 120 gigawatt hours. But at the bottom, the minimum was 15 gigawatt hours. And for 108 days and nearly a third of the year, it was under 50 gigawatt hours. That suggests that 50 gigawatt hours might be a good base to estimate what is needed, since that was available more than 70% of the time. And we need to at least meet the overnight minimum demand, which is around 18 gigawatts year round. 18 gigawatts over 24 hours gives 432 gigawatt hours. But that is more than eight times 50 gigawatt hours. It means we might need 
over eight times the current wind turbine capacity. And that seems like an almost insane amount. Just as a sanity check, since we are already at one third renewables, can we get by with three times what we have now? A question which this spotty graph will answer. Imagine rerunning the last year with exactly the same weather and energy demand each day, but with energy supplied by three times the wind turbines and three times the solar panels we have currently installed. The spots on this graph represent the surplus or deficit for each day. Only 24 days are above the red zero line. And these are in the summer months with all the rest in deficit. But there is some hope in that hydro can cover at least part of the deficit. The total capacity of hydro is eight gigawatts. And if you ran 24 hours a day, could produce 192 gigawatt hours. Looking at the days in deficit below the blue line at minus 192 gigawatt hours, the number reduces to 89. However, this would require 26 terawatt hours over the year from hydro, well above the 16 terawatt hours last year, and may be a challenge to water capacity. Also, the deficits go down to minus 454 gigawatt hours. We should be very hard to cover even with existing gas and a lot of additional pumped hydro. The three time scenario can therefore be ruled out. And yet, Note that it represents the addition of some 56 gigawatts of renewable generating capacity, which is far more than the 30 gigawatts suggested in the BCA report. Since winter is the bigger problem, and because wind is more consistent throughout the year, we need to add more wind. This graph is three times solar again, but with six times current wind capacity. It still shows 116 days in deficit, occurring all through the year except the middle of summer. However, all but 20 of these are above the blue line with a deficit of less than 192 gigawatt hours, which is within the range which can be covered by hydro. Below the blue line, three days have a deficit greater than 350 gigawatt hours. Providing this energy is no trivial matter. Snowy 2 has an output of two gigawatts or 48 gigawatt hours a day getting from 192 gigawatt hours to the worst deficit at 374 gigawatt hours requires the output of nearly four snowy twos or gas turbines. It should also be noted that these deficits tend to run over several consecutive days or even a week. For example, the peak deficit of 374 gigawatt hours was on the 9th of July, but the deficit was greater than 250 from the 5th to the 10th of July. And in fact, only two days are slightly positive between the 1st and the 13th. That is two weeks with no opportunity to recharge any pumped hydro. Only a very large pumped hydro scheme can provide this kind of energy. This is hundreds of times more than can currently be stored in batteries. And now for a bold conclusion. If we want 100% renewable energy, the 6-3 scenario would be the absolute minimum at least six times the current wind turbine capacity and three times the solar capacity. This means building five times what we already have in wind turbines. The current installed capacity of wind in the NEM is just under 10 gigawatts. At around $2 million a megawatt hour, that'll cost around $100 billion. And we will need to build twice what we have in solar. This is a bit hard to estimate. We have six gigawatts of solar farms but it's not clear how much of installed rooftop solar is effective. Although the PV Institute says we have 25 gigawatts installed, for reasons I'll not explain here, I will assume a total of 18 gigawatts. So we need to build 36 gigawatts more at a cost of around 50 billion. To provide power on those days with a large deficit in generation, we need the equivalent of four Snowy 2 schemes. But Snowy 2 will not be operational until 2027 and it will take some time to build the equivalent of another three. This means we'll have to at least keep gas generation until well into the 2030s. And even so, the existing gas turbine capacity is barely enough. Snowy 2 has frequently been criticized as a white elephant. And there are claims that the cost has blown out to as much as $10 billion. Those making the criticisms have not understood the numbers this kind of huge storage capacity is essential if the 100% renewables target is to be met. 
and by my reckoning we need four of them. Failing this, we would have to build even more wind turbines and solar farms, perhaps eight and four times respectively what we have now. My analysis has been relatively simplistic. I have not considered the growth in demand due to electric vehicles, a transition from gas heating to electric, and population growth. I've based this estimate on the last 12 months, which is not necessarily the worst case. I've ignored daily peaks. I've not considered how generation is distributed around the country and the cost of additional transmission lines. Yet you need to move energy from where the wind is blowing or the sun is shining to where it is not. The inadequacies of my analysis all lead to an underestimate of the needs. Other scenarios with less additional capacity than I've proposed could be explored but my guess is that they would all require a lot more storage, which is more expensive than generating capacity. The BCA report said we need an additional 30 gigawatts of renewable power for a cost of $50 billion. But to allow for days with low wind speeds and less sun, we need at least an additional 50 gigawatts of wind and 36 gigawatts of solar. And unless we use gas as the backup on days with large energy deficits, we will need 6 gigawatts of pumped hydro on top of Snowy 2. All up, this will cost something like $170 billion. And on top of that, we need transmission lines and batteries. In 2021, Australia added 3 gigawatts of utility solar, 3.3 gigawatts of rooftop solar, and 1.7 gigawatts of wind. While installing an additional 36 gigawatts of solar by 2030 is possible, it would take 28 years for the wind turbines at the current rate of construction. The pace of construction can of course be accelerated, but that invariably pushes up the price. We saw this in the resources boom of 10 years ago, which led to critical shortages of tradespeople. And finally, I've only considered the end point. I would not be surprised if three times solar is built fairly quickly, but with wind turbines and pumped hydro storage lagging a long way behind. If that happens, Coal-fired plants will not be shut down as planned, but will be kept online well into the 2030s, even if only for the winter months. This will mean catching up on deferred maintenance and paying for life extension work to keep them in service. But don't worry about the poor energy retailers. There will be a special levy to pay for this unforeseen activity. The price spikes of 2022 have given us a foretaste of the future.